Welcome to the Faith Bridge podcast. I'm here with Pastor Ken, who just preached a sermon called Your Best News. Stick around after the sermon and we'll answer some of your questions. Thanks for listening. Well, good morning again. Welcome. So glad that you're here. Why don't you take your Bible and we're going to go to John chapter one in the New Testament. And if you don't have a Bible and you'd like to, uh, why don't you wave at one of the ushers that are coming in the aisle right now and they'll be glad to let you have one of those. And you can keep it if you need our gift to you. So we'll get to John chapter one in just a few minutes. Uh, But first I'll uh, describe something that happened About a month ago, we were having a strategic day-long meeting, our lead team was, when one of our uh, lead team members announced suddenly, I have to leave. Apparently, our house was just broken into. And so he left, and and sure enough, uh, several hours later, the texts came in. He and his wife had met up there. And sure enough, someone had gone into their house through the back and had taken uh, TVs and some other things. And they were sort of describing what was, uh, uh, what had happened. But, but this was the interesting thing about it. Uh, Soon thereafter, it turns out another house or two in our community uh, got hit on the same day and apparently by the same culprit. Now, how would we know it was the same culprit? Because of two technological advances in the last several years, social media and camera technology. You know, you've seen the doorbell commercials for Ring and everything where they're talking, you know, through the deal. And, and, and so by evening, we're all looking on our phones at the picture of this guy who apparently was working in our community that day. And <clears throat> to my uh, count, th- because there was a flurry of texting that was going on in our little group text of our lead team of 10. To my count, I believe it was roughly half had gone out by evening and had purchased ring doorbells and other cameras to install around their homes. And I read the the text thread and I was chuckling along the way because several people put in some funny things like Seth, who leads our road ministry, he sent this um, into the into the thread. And, but I marveled at how just a couple of break-ins was better advertisement for those camera doorbells than a thousand of their uh, TV commercials. Why? Because now everybody was talking about it. Now it mattered. Now it was personal and relevant and imminent and life-changing. And I should add, in case you're wondering, I was not among the half that went out and bought a bunch of cameras and gizmos uh, security system that evening because I've been really working to sort of ratchet back my OCD anxiety tendencies. So I decided to, to hold off four weeks. Ours was installed yesterday. <laughs> and it is so much fun because you can talk to the person saying, my, my children, if you lose the phone, son, just go to the doorbell and you can contact me from, you know, from there. And <clears throat> so years ago, there was a book that came out by Malcolm Gladwell. It's called Tipping Point. And in that book, Gladwell described the magical moment when an idea or a trend or a social behavior crosses or tips over the threshold and begins to spread like wildfire. He says the same way that one person can start an epidemic of flu, so can one person start sort of a push or an epidemic of most anything, fashion ideas, diet trends, product sales, overall cultural awareness about any number of things. If you get just a few things kind of right, in short, Gladwell helps us realize that I guess potentially any of us could hold the potential to start a world changing trend. And Jesus says we should. He says we should. We should use our influence to spread a message. The message that can change a person's outlook, their, 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 their whole life. 
their perspective on this life and on the next throughout eternity. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. My concern, though, is that many of us, many of us who've come into an awareness of this good news, many of us who've trusted in the good news of Jesus and what he did on the cross and the empty tomb that we were singing about just a few minutes ago, any of us, we, we've got that good news, but we're not sharing that good news so much. As a matter of fact, my concern today is that many of us, we're spending a lot more time telling people, sharing about our favorite sports teams, you know, college sports teams or favorite fantasy athletes or favorite places to travel or favorite or least favorite political thoughts. We're prone to be sharing our kids' accomplishments and successes but if you tallied it up, I bet most American Christians are spending 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 times as much energy and time sharing about all that stuff than we're spending sharing the one message that really could change the world, that changes a person's life. The best news that can transform our world of spiritual darkness, darkness and hopelessness. And so the problem isn't that we're sharing stuff. Oh, no. We're all sharing all sorts of things. It's that we're not sharing the best news. The news that the one true God looking down upon humanity and seeing us in our sin, in our rebelliousness, in our depravity, that he didn't decide to wad us up and throw us away like a piece of paper in the basket, but rather said, I love you enough that I'm going to send my own son, my only son, who will live the life of sinless perfection that you could never live, and he'll die the death of punishment that you deserve on the cross. For your sins, he'll pay the price, and then he'll rise on the third day and triumph over that grave, the grave that we could never triumph on our own. As a matter of fact, really, when you think about it, the reason that we're here, the reason any of us is here today is because somebody shared that message with us, and before that, somebody shared that message with them, and before that, somebody shared that message with them. And you could go all the way back to the original Christians 2,000 years ago and to Jesus himself. See, we're all here because somebody was sharing that message along the way. That's how you got this message of hope and life, because somebody shared it with you. But my concern is that, especially in this day and age of technology, when we're so overwhelmed and so consumed by so much stuff that's coming in, that if anything is not making the cut these days, with many a Christian conversation, it's sharing anything about Jesus, which would make us a little bit like Antonio Stradivarius. You know, you remember who he was? He, if you're a musician, you know who Stradivarius was. Certainly if you play the violin. Because Stradivarius made the best violin that was ever constructed. I think his story is interesting. Back in the 1700s, he made this violin, but he never told anybody exactly how he did it. Parts in phases of it he had a factory and they knew but they didn't know exactly what the final little thing was that he was doing that made a Stradivarius a Stradivarius and so there's only a few hundred of them I think these days what 300 years later and whenever one of them trades it's worldwide news and it goes for millions of dollars but nobody's been able to figure out what made the Stradivarius the Stradivarius some thought maybe it was the pitch that he got down from the tree uh, somewhere in Italy so that he could mold it, or maybe it was the terrible smelling varnish that he used to put on the outside. Some concluded it was the shape of the base, the way he built the base that held the strings. Everybody had ideas, but nobody could ever confirm it or replicate it because he kept everybody at arm's length. And then, after never revealing the secret in 1737, he died. And with him died the secret 
of the Stradivarius violin. When you think about it, it's kind of a sad story. But I'll tell you a sadder story. And that story is that there's millions of Christians who have something even better than a Stradivarius. We have something that makes music to the soul, music to the heart, music that brings life. And many a Christian you'd think they're going to die without ever telling anybody about it like it was a lockdown secret because we're not sharing it. And again, it's not that you're not sharing. Oh, you share plenty of stuff. You're just not sharing that. And I fear um, that could bear consequences through the ages if we didn't take seriously what Jesus told us to do. Every generation is called to do that, to share the good news. So what I want to do is uh, look at a text and go back to where it all began, because sometimes it's helpful if you just go back to the beginning. And so we're going to look at in John chapter one, and the, the, so here's the context, just so you know what was going on. Jesus was going around northern Israel, and he was recruiting the, the men who were going to become his 12 disciples. Right, So he's recruited one whose name is Andrew, and he's recruited one whose name was Simon, who he'll nickname Peter. And then uh, in the text we're looking at right now, he's going to recruit a man named Philip. Look at verse 43 in chapter 1 of John. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to Philip, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip found Nathanael. And he said, Nathanael, we have found him, the one of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. Now, in a week or two, we're going to pick up there with the text and go further and see what happened with Nathaniel in his role. But today we're focusing on Philip. And I want to make three observations. If you're a note taker, simple observations from the text, simple to jot down, but challenging for us to apply. Uh, to apply. All right, so if you're a note taker, the first observation is this. You got to get the message right. What was the message? It was nothing complex. It was a very simple message. We have found the Savior. We have just met someone, Nathaniel, who I'm telling you, when you're in his presence, it's like everything changes. If it's safe, but it's overwhelming, it's like he knows your innermost thoughts, but it's okay. It's it's something like I've never experienced, Nathaniel, and I want for you to experience this Jesus as well. It, it's just, it's different any, than anything you've had. He's a savior. I know he is. Nathan, uh, Philip was telling Nathaniel. He's the one that you've been reading about here in the book of Moses and the prophets. We have found him. I think it's interesting that right after Jesus recruits Philip, he goes off and tells his best friend, Nathaniel. Now, you say, I didn't see best friend in there. Where do you get that? Well, you have to kind of read between the lines to figure that part out. But scholars help you point, uh, help sort of point this out, two things particularly. First of all, whenever Philip and Nathaniel, whenever the 12 disciples are listed, Philip and Nathaniel are always listed side by side next to each other. It's like they came as a cluster. As a matter of fact, in some of the other gospels, um, Nathaniel's name is written Bartholomew. So scholars surmise that must have been his surname. Another reason, they must have been best friends. And that was, well, it's a psychological reason. Just ask yourself, when you get really good news, who do you tell? Oh, you'll tell the world most news, but if it's really good news, like somebody just got engaged or somebody just got pregnant or we just had a baby or one of these kind of, or somebody's getting baptized, you tend to tell the person who matters most to you. I know in my own life, I get news like that and I think to myself, oh my gosh, I got to talk about that. I got to tell, I can't wait till this evening to tell Suzanne 
what's going on. Or maybe Pastor Dan. I got to get to him and tell him what is going on here. Because we go to our closest friends with the best news, don't we? You do that. So, of course, Philip was doing the same thing. Which brings me to this question. If you've embraced the good news, if you've got the gospel, if you've trusted in Jesus, then why wouldn't you be out telling your friends this good news yourself? I've thought to myself of at least three reasons as I was working on this message. Three reasons I think that probably hold us back. The first one is this, fear. I think sometimes we just hold back out of fear, fear that maybe somebody uh, wouldn't like us anymore if we told them what's going on in our life, what's changed in Jesus and everything, or fear that maybe somebody thinks you're a little spiritually cuckoo, a little cray-cray. Something's gone wrong here. We just don't want to go there. After all, you know, it might cost me a promotion, and I, I'm kind of in line to get this promotion. And after I get the promotion, then I can talk about Jesus all I want, you know, but I'll tell you something. That day seldom comes. You know why? Habits are hard to break. If you build a habit of silence, that won't quickly change one day. We're the product of the decisions that we made the day before that and the day before that and the day before that. But, but think about it this way. Suppose the cure to cancer was discovered and it was entrusted to you. Now, if you, if you knew what the cure to cancer was, you wouldn't just sit on your hands. You wouldn't be like, well, gosh, I don't want to tell anybody. I mean, it might hurt their feelings or something. But no, you couldn't constrain yourself from getting out there to tell this good news, right? Well, this is what we are called to do. This is what Jesus said. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Why wouldn't you want to go and share that? Don't be afraid of it. As the old preacher D.T. Niles put it, Sharing the gospel is nothing more. Sharing the good news is nothing more than just one beggar who discovered where to get food going and telling his friends, other beggars, I found the source of food. Frame it that way and it helps with the fear. A second reason maybe that we hold back from talking about Jesus, sharing the good news with people, is we're afraid we'll botch it up. We're afraid, well, what if they ask a question? It's a big theological, I don't know, a bunch of theology, and I read a bunch of books and arguments and all that. Sort of. Well, wait a second. Do you think Philip understood everything about Jesus when he went to Nathaniel? Heavens no. He just met him just, I don't know, a few hours, a day or so before. As a matter of fact, later in the Gospels, we'll read two accounts in particular that will reveal very clearly Philip did not understand everything. He would ask some very kind of basic questions later on in his discipleship. So he didn't have it all figured out, but he knew what he knew. And that was, I've met somebody who changed my life. And Nathaniel, you have got to come and meet him. It's just an altogether different ball game. This Jesus. But think about it. You, why would you hold back? Because you don't understand everything about the Bible. You don't hold back. If you have a good mechanic who fixes your car well you don't understand at least i don't understand what they did that made it work i just know that it works now it runs it doesn't rattle and it, you know and he gave me a fair price and treated me nicely and so i tell somebody you ought to go try this mechanic do i understand i don't understand anything about mechanics but i just know what works i don't know any much about cardiology I couldn't tell you much about atherosclerosis, but I do know this. Dr. Solomon knows, and he sure helped me about four years ago. I can tell that story because it's my story, don't you see? I think many times we hold back because we're afraid there's just all these questions. I got to no. There are answers to many of the questions, and we can give you those if somebody really wants to have a good uh, debate. And we've got good books that you can put somebody on to. I'm not even asking for, for that. I'm just saying, why don't you just talk about what he's done in your life? Because the best advertisement, it's not a TV commercial. It's just a satisfied customer who said, hey, let me tell you what it did for me. That's what causes the tipping point. And that's what Philip was doing. 
telling his friend Nathaniel, I've met Jesus, and I'm telling you, I'll never be the same. You need to come and you need to meet him. You need to see yourself because there is something different and changing about this man. The message was very simple. Maybe one other reason. Maybe one other reason that people hold back, and I think it is shame. They're ashamed. Not ashamed so much of Jesus. Not being ashamed about with Jesus. He lived the perfect life. Ashamed about yourself. How's that? Well, here's how. See, if you've trusted in Christ, you've given your life over to Jesus and you're a Christian and you believe in God and the Bible and church and all that stuff. And, and yet, if you've given yourself over to a little sin and a little sin became another sin and another sin became another and another and another and you, and you, you start to move away from God. This happens, doesn't it? You tell a little white lie, and then that turns into another one, and now you hardly you get a pit in your stomach when you're going to work because you're just like, oh, my gosh, this whole thing is built on lies. Or maybe it's for you gossip, or maybe for you it's rage or anger. You, 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 you haven't been fighting the fight against those tendencies. You're just giving in to it. Or maybe it's porn. Maybe some of you were looking at porn last night while your family was asleep. Or maybe some of you, you're tampering and you're, you're with, a, with an affair with a person at work or somewhere else, and you know I should not be spending time with her. I should not be spending time with him. It's getting out of hand. Maybe it got out of hand. See, the reason you hold back from talking about Jesus is because you know what's really going on in your life, and you don't want to be a hypocrite. There's this dissonance that is at least trying to hold you back from being a hypocrite, and that much is good. But the bad thing is that you're letting the devil hold you hostage to whatever it is that you've given yourself into instead of bringing that into the light and letting him transform you and incorporate even that chapter into the good news of the gospel. Don't you remember the powerful story that T.A. told last week in the story, in the sermon? He was talking about, uh, he confessed rather vulnerably, very vulnerably, it made quite an impact on any number of you. You told me and you sent me emails about it. Um, he said, I struggled with porn when I was in what, junior high and high school and college, I think he said. And, but then I got very intentional about building a sobriety plan and bringing this under the auspices and the authority of Jesus and building in the safeguards that I need to build in the safeguards uh, around me because I didn't want to give in to this, uh, especially getting married. And, 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 so, and so he told us the story and then he got to the high point of the story and all of you broke into, we broke into applause when he said, and I have been uh, sober for 15 years now from pornography. You remember when he told us that? And everybody clapped and he said, it's a daily journey, daily. I, I surrender daily. I can't tell you about what's gonna happen next week, but today I'm going to walk faithfully with God. And when tomorrow gets here, daily, I'm gonna walk faithfully with God. And he got to this line. I jotted down the line because it's such a good line when he got to the end. He said, and so that means now I don't have a story to hide. I have a story to share. And so could you. See, the gospel, if you've fallen away from the Lord, if you stepped away into sin, you're not disqualified. You need to repent and bring that under the authority and bring that, uh, bring the gospel and the good news of forgiveness and grace into that. But it'll mean you'll have to bring it into the light. Bring it into exposure. Otherwise, what will happen? You'll just put your whole life, the whole light of Jesus under the bowl, like Jesus said. You'll just, you'll just close it all up. But he said, but uh, it will never change the world if you do that. I want you to let your light shine for all the world to see. That's the only thing that's going to change the world. So let's talk about this. The message, it's very simple notwithstanding some reasons that we hold back. How did he share the message? That's the second thing. How did he share it? <laughs> Very plainly. Three key words. Come and see. Nathaniel, we have found the Savior. Come and see. 
He knew Nathaniel well enough to know. Nathaniel had some spiritual questions. He was asking some Old Testament questions, and we'll see that in a week or two when we come back. He was really trying to figure out, so who is this Messiah? Who is this Savior? And he comes running up to Nathaniel and says, Nathaniel, I've got it. We have found him. We have found the one about whom you've been reading about from Moses and the prophets, and you, but you're going to have to come and see for yourself. Come and see. It's interesting, there was a mathematician and scientist called Blaise Pascal who lived about 300, 400 years ago um, in the 17th century of France. And some of you who are mathematicians and scientists and astronomers and so, you know Blaise Pascal. You know him for the contributions that he made in your field. What a lot of people don't realize is that Blaise Pascal was a strong follower of Jesus Christ. He had a very strong faith because he'd had a very profound conversion experience when he was 32 years old. He always referred to that night as the night of fire when God met him and he put his trust in, in, in Christ Jesus his night of fire experience. Now, the interesting thing about Pascal, since he was a, a professor and he was a mathematician and a scientist and, and all those were the kind of friends that he kept, uh, other professors in France who were mathematicians and scientists. And, but that was the fast lane crowd back then, sort of like actors and, and you know, football players, pro athletes, and so today. If you wanted to hang out with the cool people, you went and got with the mathematicians and the scientists, right? And so that was the world he lived in. And he cared about all of his mathematician and scientist friends, and he wanted them to have the good news. But he knew that they, they, many of them were atheists, if not atheists, at least agnostic. And so he tried to figure out, how can I at least get them to consider that this might be real, that it might be true? And he came up with a very clever line of logic, which theologians refer to as Pascal's wager. He knew that his scientific and mathematical friends loved nothing more than to go to the horse racing tracks and to place bets on the horses. And so using that line of logic, he said to his mathematical and scientific friends, he said, okay, consider it this way. Consider there's horse A. We'll call that horse A the horse of belief. That's the belief horse. Horse B is a horse of unbelief. He said, now, suppose you place your money on unbelief, meaning in the end, when you die, you'll discover there really was no God. There really was no afterlife. There really was no nothing. They just buried you six feet under, and that was the end of your story. Well, if that is true, then you will have won. But what will you have won? Well, technically not very much. You can't even do a victory dance because you're dead and there was nothing thereafter. And so you didn't win very much. And worse, he said, if you lose the bet and you're wrong, you will discover that it really was all real and it really was all true. And then you'll have to spend all of eternity separated from God who had wanted to save you, and you'll be reminded every day that you just lost everything. He said, but on the other hand, if you place your bet on the horse called belief, when you die, you get to the end of your life, if you discover that you were actually wrong, and all this faith stuff and God and church and all that stuff was a bunch of hooey, well, what will you have lost? You won't have lost much because there wasn't anything. So you won't even find out because it just ended. But on the other hand, if you place your bet on the horse called belief and you end up correct, when you die, you get it all. You win everything, eternity and more. And so Pascal would say to his friends, look, Go with the only sensible bet. Why would you put your money on unbelief? That's a no-win bet. Both directions. But if you place your horse on the horse called belief, that's a no-lose bet. You can't lose. Pascal's wager. At this point, he would get their attention. And they would say, okay, well, you do have a point. With that, knowing 
Now that doesn't make a believer out of anybody. That just opens up a mind to the possibility that maybe there could be something. Then what he would do is engage them in a very strategic um, exercise. It was a 30-day experiment. He would say, okay, now, if you're willing to just say, just maybe, maybe all this is real in the spiritual realm, then here's what I want you to do. For the next 30 days, I want you to actually begin to step into that faith. Not with cynicism, not with skepticism, not with eye rolling, but just saying for 30 days, don't laugh at me, but for 30 days, I'm just going to try this. He said, try to pray. And not just like, worthless. <laughs> but actually talk to him like he really exists, like there really is somebody out there. And see if you don't see some correlations or causal relationships between what you're praying and what God is doing. Try praying. 30 days. Try worship. Come to worship. Listen to the songs and the singing and to the things that people say. And step into it just with the openness that maybe this could be real. Get into a community that is studying his word and, and process life with them and listening to, listen to how they're thinking and, and say, you know what, I'll do this for 30 days, not 31, but for 30 days. I'll take this seriously. Like maybe there's something that, that this could do in my soul and see at the end of those 30 days, you haven't become a believer because Pascal would say, he is real and he will meet you in the act as you step towards him. Now, some of you right now, you might need to take that 30-day experiment yourself. Maybe God brought you here today because you need to take that. Or maybe you know somebody that, that is sort of on the periphery Maybe it'd be a helpful suggestion. Just try. Just see what God does. And see if you don't start to experience something along the lines of what I've experienced. So what Pascal was saying is the same thing that Philip was saying. Come and see. You're going to have to taste and see that the Lord is good. So come and see. So it was a simple message, simple presentation, then a simple conclusion. Let's move to that. Notice Philip, he doesn't seem worked up or anxious about the results. We don't read anything about his worrying about what if Nathaniel says no and all of you. Nothing. Why? Because he knew what he knew. He knew what God had, what Jesus had meant to his life already. And he'd just been barely following him, which freed him up to not have to worry about the results. And I think that's an important word for us because I think many times when it comes to maybe talking about Jesus or putting in a word for the Lord with people that we know and love, we, we start thinking it's us, them, it's me, you, and ah, it's like an arm wrestling match, I'm going to convert you, you know, and, and that doesn't really work, you know, this is not about wins and losses, it's not about, you know, successes or failures, and that's a really important thing to get freed up from, because as long as you're held hostage to that kind of thinking, you'll, you'll give in to the devil's temptation to start arguing and, and being rude. And, and, you know, the truth of the matter is very few people have ever come towards Jesus because of a really great argument or debate that somebody got up in their face about. That doesn't tend to bring people any bit closer to Jesus. As Barclay said, the only thing that melts a block of ice, it's not an ice pick, it's heat. And the only thing that changes a heart is not harsh words, it's love.
Just the love of Jesus being transmitted by another follower of Jesus. That's what melts the heart. I thought of that when I read uh, an article that was uh, in the Washington Post a couple of years ago. I'd never seen it. I wonder if you've seen it. Um, it's written by a lady whose name is Deborah Green. It's titled, An Open Letter to Whole Food Shoppers Who Consoled Me When I Learned of My Dad's Suicide. I'll just read it to you. It says, Dear Strangers, I remember you. Ten months ago when my cell phone rang with the news of my father's suicide, you were walking into Whole Foods prepared to do the grocery shopping that you had come to do, just as I had been doing just minutes before. But I had already abandoned my cart full of groceries, and I was standing in the entryway of the store, and my brother was on the end of the line telling me that my father was dead and that he had taken his own life early that morning. And I remember my, my brother telling me, Deborah, I'm sorry. I'm just so sorry. And I hung up and I started to cry and scream and my whole body was trembling and this just couldn't be true. It couldn't be happening. Only moments before I'd been going about doing my errands on a normal Monday morning, only moments before everything was intact. And now I was overwhelmed with emotion and I fell to the floor and my knees were buckling underneath the weight of what I had just learned. And you kind strangers, you were there. You could have kept on walking, ignoring my cries, but you didn't. You could have simply stopped and stared at my primal display of pain, but you didn't. No, instead you surrounded me as I yelled through my sobs. My father killed himself. He killed himself. He's dead. I remember in the haze of the emotions, one of you asked for my cell phone and asked who you should call, asking what was my password because you needed my husband's name. I recall hearing you discuss among yourselves who was going to drive me home in my car and who would follow that person to bring them back to the store. I remember one of you asking if you could pray for me and my father. I must have said yes. And I recall now that Christian prayer being offered up to Jesus for my father and for me. And it still both brings tears to my eyes and makes me smile. In my fog, I told you that I had a friend, Pam, who worked at Whole Foods, and one of you went in search of Pam, and thankfully she was working that morning. You found her, and you brought her to me, and it was so good to see her. And even as she took me to the back to sit with her, one of you sent back a gift card to Whole Foods no, you didn't know me. You just wanted to offer something a little bit more to let, us know, let me know that you'd be thinking of me and holding me up in your thoughts and in your prayers. And that helped feed our family when I was so far beyond emotional reach to cook. I never saw you after that. But I know this to be true. If it were not for you, I might simply have gotten in the car and tried to drive myself home. I wasn't thinking straight, though. If I was thinking at all, if it were not for you, I don't know what I would have done in those first raw moments of anguish and grief. But I thank God every day that I didn't have to find out because your kindness, your compassion, your willingness to help a stranger in need have stayed with me until this day. And no matter how many times my mind takes me back to that horrible life-altering moment, it's not all darkness because you reached out to help. You offered a ray of light in the bleakest moment I've ever endured. You may not remember it. You may not remember me. But I'll never, ever forget you. And though you may never know it, I give thanks for your presence and humanity each and every day. Nothing beats the profundity of a real follower of Jesus, full of his heart, full of his love, stepping into the presence of a non-believer, just full of grace, full of hope that comes through knowing Jesus. <laughs> it leaves a mark, a mark for good a mark that you can make. And I'll tell you why this matters. <laughs> this is why it matters and why 
we just kind of felt like we should do a short series on this this fall. This shareable series. It's because of this. I can't remember. Maybe some of you who are older can, but I can't remember a time when tensions have run as high as they're currently running. Politicians and media pundits all across the continuum are calling those with opposing views crazy and stupid and out of touch and dangerous. And it's coming from every side. And several noteworthy figures are calling for uncivil disobedience and protesting and getting in the face. And three congressmen and senators have been shot or physically assaulted in the last year, making you wonder, is there worse yet to come, especially with an election in a few weeks? And, and so really, when you think about it, if there was ever a time ripe for real Jesus followers to step into this with a hopeful word, a word of never-ending promise of good news, that time, friends, is now. Because we know, we who know Jesus, know that at the center of all the chaos stands our glorious Savior, the King of Kings, whose kingdom will never end. And this world in which we live needs to have a hopeful world, word about that kingdom. So let's invite them. Let's say come and see. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to come and to just see what it was that you were doing with the very first disciples and what you did in Philip's life and how in such short time just your presence in his life changed everything and he couldn't constrain himself from running off to get his friend Nathaniel he just had to go and tell him oh Lord my prayer is that you would put in all of our hearts just the renewed touch that comes the touch that many of us were feeling when we were singing the songs a little bit ago the touch that comes from that, that day that we got baptized like we were just watching in, this film, in the video. The, the, the touch that comes from the moment we trusted in Christ the very first time. Oh, Lord, there's so many of us, though, that we get sort of walking around and, and sleepwalking in our, in our faith. Oh, God, I pray that you would bring us back to life life anew, and where there's sin that we need to repent of, Lord, that we'd come clean, that we'd get real and honest and transparent and, and get forgiven so that that can become a story to share as well as our conversion and so that we can step back into the fold of the faithful, doing what you called us to do, to let our light shine, and to go out and tell others, come and see. You just have to come and see. Lord, I pray that... Um, even in the next couple of weeks, you would do a great thing. I especially pray uh, about the 28th Fun Day Sunday. Um, the idea being, Lord, uh, we'll go out and bring our friends. And by your grace, Lord, I'm going to give my best effort to explain the gospel as simply as I might on a Christmas or an Easter that day. I pray, God, that you would help us to go out and invite people and say, come and see. That's going to be a fun day. Your kids will go to the, their area, and you can come sit with us, and it's going, to be, it's going to be full of candy for the kids and fun. I pray, God, that you would do a work in our midst. And if you're here and you've never had an, an, that initial touch, you have never trusted in Jesus in the first place, today's your day. Even right now, why don't you just right now, even as I'm praying aloud, you just pray silently, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I'm asking you to come into my soul, to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me of all unrighteousness, to fill me full of your Holy Spirit and point me in a new direction so that I would have purpose and so that I could learn as I get involved and get in a grow group and learn more about the Bible, what it means to follow you and to live as a person full of life, abundant now and eternal then. Thanks, Lord, for the ways that you are still in the business 
of changing lives. Won't you use us in that operation with those we know and love? We pray it all in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. I'm Michael Sullivan, business administrator here at FaithBridge, and I'm joined by Pastor Ken, who just brought us part one of our new series called Shareable. Thanks for being here, Pastor Ken. Sure. Uh, we've got two questions, so let's jump into answering those. The first one, uh, in your sermon, you were talking about sharing your faith, inviting people to come and see Jesus. And y you mentioned briefly uh, about a Jewish family, but this question is, how do you share your faith with people from other religions? If you were to encounter a Muslim or a Jewish person, uh, you don't want to offend them uh, by introducing them to Christianity. How do you strike that balance of wanting to share the good news but not wanting to offend them because you know that they believe something else? That's right. Well, uh, in 1 Peter, we're told to always, have, uh, always be prepared uh, to have a reason for explaining the hope that we have. Um, and so giving some forethought to it is, I think, a great idea. I can illustrate, I can answer maybe through an illustration. I'm in a group of clergy, that's a fancy word for preachers, um, that has, I think there's seven of us who are Christian pastors, seven Jewish uh, rabbis, and seven uh, Muslim imams. Hmm. Sounds like it'd be a joke. Uh, what do you get when you have seven? Yeah. And, but it's not. It's it's a serious group. And the idea is that we would come together uh, and you know, certainly listen to each other and, and learn from each other and this sort of thing. But more importantly, um, that we might be able to even care for one another and especially in times like Hurricane Harvey, uh, even work alongside one another, maybe with a little better understanding than uh, in the previous uh, times. Mm -hmm. So we were having our initial retreat for 24 or 48 hours, and it was really interesting, and it was a well-guided experience by a person who's kind of organizing this whole thing. And at one point, one of the Jewish rabbis said, well, I just got to come out and we're being honest here, right? And we're trying to build friendships and, and, and that's right. He said, it's kind of hard for me to believe that we could ever really be too much of friends because you Christians, you always want to convert us. And all of us Christians were like, mm, well, yeah, kind of. But then my friend Steve Besner at Houston Northwest Church, he spoke. And what he said it just couldn't have been improved upon. It was marvelous. He finally said after a tense moment of silence, he said, well, yes, I guess we all always are wanting to share the good news, but it's not because we wouldn't also want to just enjoy friendship with you, even if you never converted, even if you never uh, turned to Jesus, we still would want to be your friends. Mm -hmm. But he said, what we would hope that you would understand and that you could even respect about us is that we just believe so much in what we've experienced about the good news that Jesus brings that we can't constrain ourselves from talking about it sometimes. Mm. And I, I was like, that's it right there. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the right spirit. Um, um, you know, uh, at, at the foundation, we, we certainly want to have a friendship. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Let's pursue that. If you want to talk theology and spirituality and God and all that kind of stuff, then we can certainly 
do that, and I would love to do that because okay. I enjoy talking about what the Lord has done in my life yeah. and for my life, and I do believe that He'll do it for you, and it would be no uh, no less uh, powerful for you. Yeah, you're really hitting on almost the tone of the conversation the tone. and leading with that kindness and genuine care, which is in your closing illustration, yeah, the story. that couple from Whole Foods did. They yeah, were just yeah. exploding with kindness yeah. and care, yeah. and that helps. Well, the second question came in and was asking about, what about people with church hurts? You know, people who have been wounded by the church. Sure. So when they hear, come and see, their initial reaction is, oh, I've seen, and it's painful, and I'm yeah. not going back yeah. in there. How would you yeah. respond to someone like that? Yeah, wow. Even in the last 24 hours in the community, in a conversation I found myself, I met such a person. Hmm. She said to me, so what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a pastor. She said, huh. She said, where? And I said, at Faith Bridge. She said, well, you know, I, uh, I grew up in church. And I said, would you still go? No, I don't. Why don't you go? She said, well, not because of God because of the people. Like, well, I, I, I've heard that before. I said, well, why don't you just come to Faith Bridge and have a new start, a fresh start? And she said, well, thanks. She said, I, I, I think I just, I, I want a little bit more time just to kind of, I didn't want to probe into, I didn't sense she wanted to tell me kind of what had happened and I didn't need to know it. But the wounds are real and people do carry them. and. Uh, oftentimes it's not God that they're upset with, it's, it's other Christians mm -hmm. who were operating maybe not in the fullness of the Holy Spirit and said something, did something, uh, and brought pain into their lives. And that's terribly unfortunate mm -hmm. uh, when that happens. I would say uh, when we encounter somebody uh, like that, um, well, just make sure that we're not piling on more hurt mm -hmm but that whatever we're doing or saying um, with that person can be a balm of healing. Mm -hmm. And maybe in time they would say, well, you know what, I, I, I do trust you and I respect you, and so maybe I, maybe I might come with you um, to the place that you say is, is kind of working in your life. Uh, here again, I think there's a timing and a tone thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it requires uh, gentleness and patience. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, to, to, to get that, uh, it's, it's an art and a science, right? And mm -hmm. so, um, uh, I guess that's what I would say, but, but ne never give up on them. Mm -hmm. uh, show them you care and that they're always welcome and occasionally season your conversation with an invite. Sure. You never know. One day they're like, actually, I think I would now. Yeah. Well, thanks for addressing those, and thanks for a great kickoff to the Shareable series. And thank you for joining us on Postscript. We'll see you back next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.